Blog Talk Radio. Here at ACO Radio, American Communications Online, or any affiliated stations or websites are not responsible for what guest hosts or call-ins may say. All programming is intended for informational and entertainment purposes only. Morris and American Communications Online with TJ Morris ET Radio. So welcome aboard all you ground troops spinning around smartly on the planet for how many years have you been spinning around on what we call home Earth Gaia? Well tonight we're helping people learn more about other people in our category spirituality. And uh, we're going to discuss some artwork that uh, is special to a certain person and why uh, art has helped uh, people express who they are and how they are and what they are. And I'm just really excited to get to know a new person tonight. And Suzanne Wyman Flynn and uh, Rich Flynn will be here. And uh, they live in California, Dana Point, and uh, they're going to introduce us to Jack Rutherford. And I get... okay. <laughs> How are you today? Okay, I think I can hear Jack. But go ahead. You want to introduce yourself, Suzanne? Yeah. Hey, it's Suzanne Wyman Flynn, the Power Psychic, and it's so nice to be here. TJ, it's so nice to hear your voice. And uh, <laughs> um, we just held on in time, I think. Hey, Jack, you're on the you're, you're live on the radio, Jack. Yeah, well, Jack, I'll, I'll try to keep it. I'll try to keep it Yeah, well, I'll do that. Introduce yourself. You're you're live. Well, I'm Jack Rutherford. I'm an artist, and I'm coming from Spain, and I'm uh, working here now in uh, Latin America and the states and. Europe, a little bit of everywhere. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. So uh-huh. I kind of ex- exhibit different places, and so it's quite a, it's an exciting world to work. Mm-hmm. It so, is. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. So hi, Jack. It's Hello. Jack. Yeah. yeah. Jack, it's just, TJ. Just... Say hi to TJ for me. Hi, TJ. How are you? <laughs> hi, Jack. <laughs> I saw your YouTube. You're a wonderful artist and a wonderful teacher. I'm very impressed with you on YouTube. Uh, uh, tell us a little about yourself. I've got some people here. I don't know how many of these people are your family, but uh, quite a few people it looks like. They're all on, just so everybody knows. So you'll have to tell Jack and me who you are with Suzanne. Uh yeah. Seven one four four hundred. I think that's Suzanne. And who's seven one four three four eight? Is that is that? Uh, I, I, I'm not. I'm not sure. Suzanne's not here right now. Okay. okay. Maybe that's, Rich. That's, what's, the, what's the number here? That's me. Rich Flynn. Okay, Rich Flynn. 
Uh, Rich is also an artist, richflynn.com, and tonight we're really excited to have everybody here that's here tonight. Is there anybody else I need to expect, Suzanne, because, uh, you know, other people coming in that are going to talk about our Ace Folk Life Society? Not tonight, unless we get some surprise callers. I'm looking forward to it. Okay. Okay. Uh, Rich, uh, Rich, are you on a different line than Jack? Yes. No, no, he's he's on the. uh, I'm holding. I'm holding his phone right now. Okay. Okay. Let's. Let's, uh, Suzanne, get everybody introduced for us, and okay. well, some people will. We'll just sit here and listen for a few minutes. Jack, I'm real excited to hear about your life story, and Suzanne and Rich is going to help prompt us so we can create this great, wonderful show tonight in honor of well, Jack so- Harris Rutherford. So go hey, ahead, Jack. Suzanne. Hey, get us Jack. Started. Can you- okay, great. It's Suzanne Wyman Flynn. Jack, can you hear me? Clear as a bell? Yeah, I can, I can hear you fine. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Good. It's, good. It's, 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 it's all right. So you started out in Long Beach, California, and your mother took you to get some watercolor art lessons when you were 11 years old. And That's you studied right. Exactly. With, yeah, and you started with a, studied with a man who was at the time a very eminent watercolor teacher, painter. And, That's right. That's right. Uh, yeah, and so start start there. How how? Yeah. What was his name? I think of his name as Hans. I remember Hans Wexler, and then I can't remember. Oh, Axel. No, that's that's pretty close there. Yeah, the uh, that was a watercolor teacher. He lived right up the alley. They used to walk up there and they'd, they'd give me lessons. He's he's quite a character. He's a collector also. So the place was like a little museum. <laughs> and I was 11 years old. I was I was odd. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Very, yeah. Very and, and then after yeah. that, you ended up studying with um, another man, and I want to say his name was Carl, and his Carl. last and what was his last Stace. name? His last name was Stacey. Stacey Seller. Yeah. Stacey. Yeah. He was, he was Viennese actually. Okay. He's American, but, he, but he, he, he's from Vienna, and uh, he was quite uh, an eye opener for you know, culture in general and, and philosophy. And you know, I studied with him. I think I started when I was about 11 years old, and then I had a girlfriend. She took me down there, so that was <laughs> that, that Polish meal. I kept going there for some years. Okay, okay. And when we go online and we look at his page, you can see a whole page of your artwork. Included oh, well, in that that's page, good. and he um, apparently was really um, famous for doing um, what is it? Uh, an architectural style of painting, where he did mm-hmm. openings, groin vaulting, and he did it in paintings. It was quite elaborate. Yeah, yeah, I enjoyed some of that. That was quite nice. Yeah, it was, it was sort of one period of, of, of my work when I did that, and. Uh, then the rest of it gets uh, much more expressionistic, I think. Okay. So it's, okay. okay. And, and uh, what? And it change, changes all the time, of course. Right. So today you've done you've done so many different things throughout your life. You worked as a um, you did your teaching when you were at the Finca in south right. of Spain, and right, exactly, you. Yeah. Arts and growth, and you had people would come for two weeks, and they would stay in your home, and they would paint and do That's yoga, right, right, right. eat yeah. a vegetarian diet, and get exactly. into the, <laughs> the entire spiritual journey. And at one point, you told me about a book written by Henry Miller, and it's called "To Paint Is to Love Again." Oh, and he, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, and he talked about how. If he'd had a great day of writing, he would paint, and sometimes he would get as many as eight paintings done. And so his idea was that if a person was really doing what they loved, they could return to painting, and it would revitalize him. And he, of course, was quite popular in Big Sur, 19, I think it was the 1940s and 50s. 
Yeah, and, I just did that there one time. Yeah. yeah. Big Sur. Uh, Big Sur. And of course, of course, uh, Henry Miller was <sighs> mentored and um, supported financially as a patron by Anais Nin. And so I always love to bring Anais Nin into any story. So Anais course, Nin, yeah. yeah, Anais Nin, she was the one who was the patron, and he was married to June Miller, who was, of course, a famous Broadway star. But that book, To Paint to Love Again, is just an inspiration. If you get back to painting and the time for painting, you revitalize your soul and your spirit, and then you're able to return to a more balanced place. And it doesn't matter if you're a doctor or if you are a writer or you are a dancer. If you go back to painting, you're revitalized. And it's such an inspiring process um, I enjoyed it so much. So um, I really, I really liked the um, ar- article about online, and it talks about how you were part of a group of artists, and you were living on. I think it was said Lake Chapas. Is that right? How do you, you know, say Lake, that? Lake Chapala. Lake Chapala. Lake Chapala. It's, it's the biggest lake in uh, in, in Mexico. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's, a be- it's a beautiful place in a place called Ahihik and Chapala is the next town there. And quite a few of the uh, famous people, like uh, uh, Millers and different ones, uh, would come there and stay in Chapala. And then, of course, it became quite a refuge for German artists as well after mm-hmm. the war. And so they had submarine commanders and all sorts of things. So, and then very wealthy people, uh, they came in as well. And uh, mm-hmm. no, it was, it was kind of hit a, it hit a high point there. Now it's, now it's pretty well crowded with. Uh, with tourists and that sort of thing. Right. So talk talk about um, your friends, Peter um, Hoff. I I want to say Huff, but it's Hoff, and his wife Eunice Hunt. And oh, how, Hunt, yes, yes, yes. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're brilliant, brilliant people, really very nice. I saw them last time in Europe, and then uh, I, well, it's been some years now, and uh, they were both very active in the arts. And uh, she was very good. She was she was sort of the star, I think, and really, right. really very, very talented. Right, right. So, so okay, so um, we did um, Carl Seth, Seth Eller, um Hans so Ox, yeah, and then Hans Axel Wallin. Is that how you say it? W A L L E N. Yeah, Wallin. Wallin, yeah. Wallin. That's true. And then, and then there's that chapter of where there you are in the city, there you are down in Mexico, and you have um, this family, and you have a wife, and you've got four sons, and you're working as an artist, and you're trying to make a living, and share with us the journey to being becoming an incredibly talented uh, artist today in the world. You have shown oh, all over Europe. All over America, all over Mexico. I mean, you really have hit. You really have hit the continent with uh, showing your art and displaying your talent. So, no, share with us been, a little I'm, of that. I'm, I'm really grateful for that. Well, I went to Mexico without any expectation. I just bought a. Uh, uh, you know, I had no. I, I never left the country before, and so I just bought a big. Uh, what do you call them? A station well, wagon. Uh, At first, it was a station wagon and piled everybody in, and <laughs> and drove down to drove down to Mexico. It was just sort of a, uh, without you know without any advance warning of what I was getting into, <laughs> and uh, of course I got into a marvelous marvelous place and a very receptive place to people. So I, I loved Mexico. So I fell in love with it. Mm-hmm. Well, and so it, it stayed stayed for some years. Mm-hmm. So that was from uh, like 1963 to 1971. You were, <laughs> you, yeah, you were living as a, um, what do they call it? They call it the Patriots. You were, a, you were a Patriot living in a foreign country, pursuing the arts and living a life. <laughs> yeah, spiritual it was growth. A beautiful, life. beautiful life. Yeah, I did the arts and growth school. I started that concept sometime in Mexico and. Uh, so I always put the two together, arts and growth. So I always think of it as being spiritual as well as uh, uh, just uh, skillful. So it's sort of going beyond skills. And there's a philosophy as well that, that interests me quite a bit. And mm. so, and uh, and, it, and it works. I have a lot of uh, 
a lot of students actually all over the world, and so it's kind of kind of gratifying. And I, I had some. Hmm. Hmm. That's good. That's good. So, you know, I'm I'm going to ask you to share a story, and it's up to you if you want to share it or not. Or not. But you told me that there was a time when you were down there, and you were on Lake Chapella, and you were with a group of students. And something unexplained occurred down on the lake, and it was just one of those magical moments. Yes, it was a, one of the UFO things. I had a group of students, <laughs> and I looked, uh, looked at the lake, it's, with, it's quite large, and uh, we were, out, were outside having coffee or something between the break. And uh, we all look up, and there was what we, uh, it was, as far as we can tell, a, a UFO. It was inexplicable. And uh, so there was about, there was about seven or eight people that saw it, so it wasn't it wasn't alone uh, alone uh, witnessing, and uh, it was it was, you know, it was it was exciting, but uh, it, it was moving pretty fast, and then it stopped and then turned around and moved around again. So it was definitely something unusual. You know, yeah. Sort of sort of stand frozen in space, so to speak. So I was excited. That was uh, wow. the, the UFO. So um, my husband <laughs> has turned out to be, I think, one of the great examples of your teaching and your mentoring. He has embraced your lifestyle and he has, you know, gone on the artist's journey to um, try and achieve fame and greatness and financial security. And um, one of the things he told me, he's always told me, he tells me again and again, is that he saw you doing this artist's journey with all these children with you, all of your beautiful sons. (laughs) And yeah, he yeah. said he said no to having children because he was too afraid that if he had children he wouldn't pursue his arts. And so yeah, it's yeah. always always been a great great story for um, him to talk about that. But um, the first year that Rich came and he lived with you at the Finca, and I don't know how to say it. I think it's called Canias de. de- Albaida. 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 Can you say Albaida? And it's a it's a very uh it's the last it's the last uh, uh uh thing on the on the road that goes up through the mountains there. And uh, it was never very famous and uh, so it was perfect, you know. And then there was no road. We crossed the Roman bridge to get there by by foot for many years and finally they blasted in a road, you know. But before you had to walk it down across the Roman bridge, it was quite a it was quite, a, quite adventurous, and uh, then I had kids, so I finally, I finally, I finally got a motorcycle, and then we all pile on it, and I'd go down the path, and so <laughs> it got a little, more, a little more dangerous, probably, you know. Mm-hmm. So, talk about your first days. You take and you buy this Finca, and Joseph, your fifth son, is a newborn baby, and you move right. into the, you move into this Finca, and you're going to start, you know. You're going to start your arts and growth classes, yeah, yeah. and 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 talk about the the actual real condition of this abandoned olive oil mill. Well, that was uh, that was all the old all the old equipment in there, big olive presses and things like that. And so, uh, I had to I had to, uh, I got junk people up to to pick it up. I'm kind of sorry I did after that because I had 400 olive trees, and uh, so I. I had to go out and, and kind of take care of the four hundred dollar trees as well. So it turned yeah. into sort of a multi, a multi work. Uh huh. So, so the story you told me before was that when you moved in, there was no floor, there was no, no windows, there was no doors. No. <laughs> there was, there was a, bee, there's a beehive in the window, and I slept in the same room with the bees, and I got a lot of time. They they, they didn't bother anybody, so yeah. so I just left them there. <laughs> Uh-huh. So they buzz uh-huh. in and buzz out. So, and it was really pretty. It was very, very rustic. So I just, they never, they were, the walls were about you know, half a meter thick. And so the big job was trying to put windows in because they didn't believe in windows in. And uh, so then I, it was always a job trying to go through about a foot, a foot of an adobe. So it was a challenge. A beautiful mm-hmm. place. It, 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 really beautiful. beautiful. And, uh, and it was known as the it's sort of the centerpiece of the estate. Of, of a, a duquesa, a duchess, and she had two, she had two or three places there like that, and they, and of course the, the villages were actually like the, the peones, the, 
the, not the slaves, but the, uh, they, they all worked there. They, everything revolved around Faker. So if I said, I'm coming from the Faker, I didn't have to give my name or anything. They all, they say, here comes the guy from the Faker. So there's <laughs> kind of a, a notoriety. And uh, so when I passed through the village and all the time, if I passed the line, I'd be stoned by the time I got through, you know, pretty good. Nice. <laughs> uh-huh. But lots of local wine was made in people's kitchens. And the nice part of the story that you always share is that the locals always shared their wine, and they had their 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 Boda bags, their Buda bags, yeah, or whatever right. you call know, right? it's, it's a, bo- and it's a Boda bag. It's a leather bag, yeah. That's it, yeah. Goat skin. <laughs> well, it's, uh, and then they, and then they put the pit inside of it to uh, take away uh, the good ones. They just sort of, you know, they kind of soak it up. With it. But the ones they sell, they usually uh, put plastic something inside. But the real ones with the leather. And uh, I guess that you know helps the help flavor. I guess but the uh, the farmers would come down with the Buddha, and of course you couldn't pass by one without talking and having a sip of wine. And so mm. <laughs> it, was, it was almost dangerous to get out at walking time because I'd I'd come home uh, you know, about half lit, you know, meeting my neighbors. <laughs> <laughs> it was funny. <laughs> very good. beautiful people. Nice very, people. Very, mm-hmm. very, very mm-hmm. beautiful. So Rich's story always, uh, the story that he tells about the time he spent with you at the Finca was you got up in the morning and you did yoga, uh, you had breakfast, did yoga, and then it was studio time, and everybody came into the studio and went to work. That's right. So it was was a good regime. It was quite good. And uh, uh, and, and people, people quite enjoyed it. You know, it seemed, it seemed like it wasn't, it wasn't like it was something that you know you had to do. But uh, they'd get up and uh, everybody got into it. You know, we had a lot of, fun. I actually had a lot of fun with them. And we would walk over the neighboring villages to have breakfast and things. And, no, it was, it was a, a very relaxed type of uh, school. And that's where I sort of kept it. You know, and, and I call it arts and growth because I, I went to schools in nature, and then of course I, the, the philosophy there is the uh, the concept of the artist as a, as a pivotal person in society. And uh, so it builds up the ego that it's quite good. <laughs> I have fun okay. with it. I'm still, I'm still doing it, actually. In right. Spain, I have uh, not as many students, but uh, I, have, I have some coming in just about all the time. And then good. they work with me. And so, no, no, I, well, I like teaching. I like, I like uh, sharing. But, yeah, it really, really keeps it alive. I have fun with it. <laughs> So I'm gonna I'm gonna take us off topic for a second, and then I'm gonna bring the story back around to you. I'm just gonna take okay. us off for a second. Okay. I'll, 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 be, I'll be listening. Absolutely. Okay. Good. So um, Toynbee, who um, was a um, cultural anthropologist, he mm-hmm. said that a civilization uh, lived or died based on whether or not the creative minority was suppressed. So if you suppress the creative minority, which is always about 10%. I always think that's so interesting. Take any society, there's been 26 civilizations on the planet that have come, um, that have come, and out of those 26 civilizations, 10 of them remain today. And the only time a civilization fails and falls apart is when the creative minority is suppressed. Mm. And so... Uh, mm-hmm. Right. So... So when you think about your work and your support and your encouragement and you living this life, because it's not an easy life. A lot of people can't do it. They don't have enough faith. Um, And you live this life and you support the creative minority by just going about and doing your work and believing that it will all be taken care of, and this is your philosophy. Um, You've done more than just be an art teacher and an artist. You've actually... Um, entered into the agreement to support a civilization and to keep it alive and to keep it well. And so I'm trying to, I was trying to figure out, so basically you started in 78. So for 42 years straight, you know, no gaps, you started before that in Mexico, but basically um, you have close, I think close to 50 years as working as an art teacher, an artist, uh, learning, and if we go back a little bit further than that, you know, you started in your 20s, and that was your dream to be an artist. Right, so, exactly, yeah. Right? <clears throat> that, was, that, was, that was the whole dream. 
So that's why I drove down to Mexico, where it was really, really uh, much more receptive in the states. Uh, yeah. To me, at that, at that time, you know, and now, now it's better. But uh, so that's what I, I, you might say. I escaped to Mexico, which I thought was going to be, you know, a new paradise, and it was for a while. It was really quite nice. And I lived right. on the Lake Chapala, and uh, I had people like Time Magazine come down and do articles and all sorts of stuff. It was quite exciting. Hmm. Very, very exciting. So I'm always sort of, I'm always sort of surprised because the quality of your work is inspiring. Um, well, the subject you, that the, the subject that you cover is is always you know whether I'm looking at the archetypal process or I'm looking at the structure of the piece it's it's always just just amazing art to look at so well, thank you. That's good, huh? yeah no it it really is and it's kind of an interesting thing because um, it's a greater responsibility to take and live out your dream than to actually figure out all of the ins and outs about art and being a business person and marketing and all of these other pieces. But it is nice to hear you say that you really um, had that chapter while you were living at the Finca where it was quite quite relaxed and quite beautiful and quite um, quite one with nature. You had to cross exactly. over a Roman bridge and, you know, walk in. And then, of course, the Finca turned out to be an incredibly beautiful building after you had worked on it for more than 20-some years. Then it turned out to be something quite special. And uh, It's a five-star hotel now. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, that's a fact. It's a, I was stunned when I went out there. It's basically the same thing, but it was, really a, it was a beautiful building. It's 50 meters long and about 11-something meters wide, and uh, so there's quite a number of rooms there. There's uh, two sections, a big dormitory and a big classroom, and uh, so it's a uh, it's, it was made for something like that, I think. It, it, was, it was perfect. And then nice grounds. I put it in a swimming pool, too, and so the whole thing became, I actually find it became too luxurious. <laughs> so, too nice. Too luxurious, yeah. <laughs> so did you think that when Rich, my lovely husband, came to be your student, did you actually think that he had what it took to become an artist? So just for everybody else's clarification, <laughs> Rich is your nephew through your sister Lois, yeah, right, and yeah. so and Lois never never tired of telling me how wonderful you were and how important you were in her life. Did you ever think that <laughs> when you had good. Rich Rich as a student that he would take and you know I mean this is I mean this is almost well, it's not forty years later but it's more than thirty five years later. Here it is thirty five years later. And you're watching him do his art. Did you ever believe that when you started teaching him, that he would turn into the artist that he is today, the great artist that he is today? Well, that's that's uh, that's always very open, you know. But the, he was always very enthusiastic about it, and uh, uh, it suits him well. And uh, he's doing a great job now. He's, he, and he's quite good. He's quite skilled at all. So, so it was a good investment, I think, and I was very pleased with that. So, oh, good. Uh, to, it's really you, nice. uh, go ahead. Yeah. Do you have Do you have any um, other family members who you yeah. obviously you know you pursue? I believe that um, as a parent, I believe children pick up a lot of information through osmosis. Just being around it, just knowing it, just seeing it all the time, they pick up a lot. And I never have been one to think that I had to teach or instruct my children. I figured if through um, seeing what was going on, the model behavior, they were interested in it, then they would express a desire to know more. And if they didn't express that, well, that was just who they were. They were different people. But any one of your children in particular come to mind today as being um, an artist, even in another area of the arts? I mean, I, I can think of several of your children that are artistic, but I'm curious to hear your opinion. Well, I have one that's a very good sculptor. And, of course, that's not a, a hard item, so he has a hard time making a living with it, uh, but he's a, a very good sculptor. And then I have others that have, uh, you know, they, they paint and, and draw and things like that, but none have gone totally what you call professional, where they depend upon it. And that's, mm. uh, yeah, it, it takes a, a little bit of fortitude for that because it doesn't always work every day. You know? It can be difficult. Uh, mm -hmm. So, uh, so what, what would you say was sort of the, the magic sort of formula to, you know, because cause I've known Rich now for a long time. I mean, we've only, yeah, I mean, I've known him since 1999. And um, 
you know, we're coming up on nine years of marriage in October. And what would you say was sort of the the formula? I mean, an artist needs somebody to, you know, take care of the day-to-day work but give them enough yeah, freedom. Yeah. And, I mean, there's so many components. Talk about some of the components that are necessary to live this life and to succeed because you really have succeeded where other people wouldn't have even tried. It is interesting. Well, it's just uh, it's not a question of uh, making a living or anything like that. It's a question of living because you know, if you're not doing what you want to do, you might as well pack it in. And it's the only mm-hmm. thing that I really wanted to do. And so I, I actually did everything else to make it possible. You know, I, you know, I did construction. I did all sorts of stuff and uh, handyman work and a lot. And uh, so that's actually I went to Mexico because I found in the States that it just wasn't, uh, just wasn't on. And so when I got to Mexico, it was marvelous. I had people that would, you know, uh, Take, take a real interest, and uh, so I set up shop there actually in Lake Chapala, and that's where a number of artists uh, went. And uh, uh, so it was uh, it, it just I try to think of one of the amateurs and writers were there, and uh, so it was very very receptive. And then of course there's a certain amount of wealth there as well, and uh, so it was, a, it was a perfect place to go. And uh, I'm I'm ready to save my life actually because I could have done it in the states, I'm sure. Mm-hmm. At that time. So, so uh, I've got kind of kind of a little little different drive here. I'm kind of thinking of like the people in your life, um, not just the people that bought your art, but I'm thinking of, you know, a wife that helped you, uh, or you know, a lifestyle, yeah. or something like that. Well, I, I certainly had that when I first got started there, and uh, lived with a woman there for some time, and she was marvelous and everything, and. Uh, but the place was really cut off, and so finally I got her an apartment, made an apartment arrangement in the village for her. And then, of course, what I did is I had to travel up north, and uh, I'd go up to uh, Brussels and give exhibitions and so on and so forth. So I'd be away some time. And, of course, that's not really red hot. I'm up there sort of winding and dining with all, <laughs> all these people and, and leaving her down there alone. So it wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't uh, it was too much of that sort of thing. And mm-hmm. so I think she probably got, t- got tired of it. Well, that's that's interesting. You know, that's that's kind of a interesting thing because I think that one of the things that work really well for Rich and I is that there's a lot of times when I'm out and I'm at work and people are whining and dining, as the expression goes. I don't drink, but people are dining you and romancing you and putting you into an opulent setting. And my work has my work has its own uh, value, and I have my own reputation. And so when Rich takes and he can take me with him, and I can go and see what he does, he he wants me to go with him. And when we can, we like to go and see what the other one is doing and how the project goes. But I think one That's of the things I I think it's an important point that if you're a successful artist, and you've been a very successful artist. You've had a, you've had a lot of recognition. You've had a lot of fame. You've had a lot of stardom. I think the person who's with you has to be incredibly secure in their own work and their own efforts and their own pursuit of where the universe validates who and what they are outside of the relationship. Because if I was reliant on my husband, Rich for validation, yeah. I would feel very, very empty. But my own work is so satisfying and so fulfilling that, you know, I'm just nothing but happy for him to have his yeah. work and his moment in the in the spotlight. But that's an interesting thing that you said that. I don't think I've ever heard you say that before. And so I think that's kind of an interesting thing. And I think that um, part of the process of going – and learning with you is is that you have to be willing to touch into your own spirituality and mm. find yourself and find the validation that the universe gives you for what your true objective is because eventually that person wanting what you have or being jealous of the attention you get is not going to support the partnership in a way that's stable to really further you. I mean, really, really further you. Um, there has mm. to be a real balance. Well, there is a, a bit of a, like I say, I'd, I'd go up north sometimes, and uh, 
you know, they have to stay in all sorts of places. And uh, we'd go from uh, sort of rags and riches at that. They were different that's one day, and the next day would be in some kind of a, uh, Amsterdam dormitory where, you know, it's, it's a crowd of people. So it was up and down all the time. And uh, so uh, if I were a wife, I'd been a little worried too, you know. <laughs> I think mm-hmm. because it's, it's, a, it's a very, very tempting environment to be in. And then if you sort of shine in one area, then, of course, that, that, uh, that, that attracts people. And so, mm-hmm. but uh, uh, I didn't, I didn't stay, so I came home. So that was, I guess, that's the, uh, the answer there. Mm, that's the, as we like to say in cliche land, we like to say the proof of the pudding is is that you wanted to go back home, you wanted to go to the finca, you wanted to oh, return yeah. to your wife, you wanted to return to your children. So that's lovely. It's really, really quite lovely. But it is also quite heroic to do this uh, hero's journey with children in tow. So it is in that at that point when I look at the story, that is kind of um, kind of always a inspiration for me. So I'm gonna is is uh, is Rich available to talk a little bit, Rich? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Rich. Yeah, I'm here. Rich, okay. Right there, right okay. Come I'm gonna here. work. We're gonna we're gonna we're gonna mute you for a second, Jack, and we're gonna talk Richard. to Rich for a minute, okay? Yeah, he's okay to come on. Rich, she okay. wants to talk to you. Rich, <laughs> I'm here. Oh. I'm here. Okay. <laughs> Hi, Rich. Hi, Hi how's it going? Hi, Rich. Oh, Hello, TJ. TJ. Hi. Yeah, hey, I'm been... really interested in uh, what uh, <laughs> Jack is helping us create here for other people that are artists. Hopefully, because uh, we've got so many authors, and my husband was an artist, so we created the Ace Folk Life together, but he's passed, and I think it's wonderful that you're honoring one of our elders tonight, and that Jack is willing to come on, and I'm hoping that you can explain to us how your art was developed from his style, because I noticed online, thanks to the uh, internet and cyberspace, I can see... I've never met these people, folks, but they're going to help us run our global world ace folk life, honoring our artists and our authors, but uh, visual and performing artists as well. But uh, there's such a similarity, and uh, the way that you paint and the way you became famous in doing all these events, going around doing weddings, I would like to know, uh, did Jack do that? I understand that he, he he may not be able to paint now, but we haven't discussed that because of his eyesight. But I'd like to know, is there uh, anything similar that he did that made you get into uh, fast painting? I don't know what it's called, so you're going to have to educate us here, but that's also part of what we do is get to know people plus whatever they can teach us. So can you share with us, uh, Rich, because uh, I'd sort of like to explain how you took from him and how you're related and uh, how you got into art with your Uncle Jack. But leave us the history here, if you don't mind. We're all, so many of my friends have passed already, and the whole point of me doing this radio show was actually for this type of show tonight, was to get oral history down. So can you give us an idea? Because people are going to see more and more of your artwork, and Jack's Artwork is only going to increase over time in the G clays, but give us some ideas, and uh, then you can bring Jack on. I'd like to hear you and Jack reminisce back and forth, but uh, I'm going to meet right. myself now. But it gives you an idea of what I'm looking for personally, but I'm sure you have some ideas of your own for this tonight's story. But I'm, I'm blending together my story and my husband that was an artist and past. He only did he did artwork, but at the last he only did pen and ink because of his eyes. So right. uh, you can explain all that and why it is that we're trying to build this organization, and I've asked you guys to come forward and support it. It needs people to support other people. All right, I'll mute. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, I think for me the journey started when uh, I wanted to go backpacking in Europe. I thought that was one thing I always wanted to do. And so I did it and I'd never been anywhere else in the world. I grew up in Anaheim, California. And so I uh, went backpacking and I started out in Amsterdam and worked my way down to see my uncle in Spain. And so 
when I got down there, it was just pretty magical. It was pretty untouched. This was 1984. No, 1981. Okay. And so the, it was just really pure. I mean, guys were still going to work on their donkeys and their mulos, and his, their place was pretty rustic, but I saw all the students there. And it was, I stayed there, I think, for two weeks. And it's just, it was just magical, absolutely magical. It's sort, of, it's sort of like Southern California with the landscape, but it was uh, in nature. And he lived outside of a village called uh, Quinius de la Baida that was dated back to the year 900. And they probably had about 800 people living there. And so it was just so magical that when I got back uh, to the United States, back to California, I just didn't want to get involved in the day-to-day life here. And it took me like three years to finally figure out, well, what do you really want to do? Let's do that again. <laughs> I'm not going to go forward unless I go back to Europe again. So I sold my car. My mom was crying. She was all upset that I was doing this. I was 24 at the time. And I took off for Spain. And I landed in Germany. And then it wasn't a backpacking trip anymore. And that was real. So I was kind of like really, really emotional about it. Like, oh, man, what have I done, you know? And then it was, I uh, arrived in this place in, in February, and it was cold, and it was dark, and there was no students there. He was just living his day-to-day life. And so that's how the journey began. But I committed to being an artist. I thought, you know, this, he sort of blazed the trail by sort of living a life that was sort of really unusual, really, it seemed more rewarding to me than working 30 years and getting retirement and then doing that whole trip. And uh, so it was just a personal decision, and then it's something I really wanted to do. And so I, I, when I arrived there in February, we you know pieced things together, and then the students started arriving right in about May and June. And um, so I was a work student. I was cleaning and cooking and doing all sorts of stuff around the, the finca during the summertime. And then it, that went on into the fall. He had students from all over South America, uh, Europe, and they all studied with him. And it was, so I spent a whole year just living really in a small town, real Spain. It was, there was, you know, people were getting, people were dying. You see a procession going up the street, and then there's a new baby being born, all in this magical little village. And, um, so then at the time I had to leave, it was like uh, December, and I came back, and I just, the things that I remembered was how he would go to bars and restaurants, or anywhere you'd go, and you'd sit down, and you'd start sketching people as, they're, as, the, as the life around you. So that was just part of doing live sort of events, which is called a la prima. You just do them in one shot. And you try to capture the feeling of the day more than just the the illustrating the day. So, yeah, and he told me when I got back, he goes, well, you have to create about 300 works and just go home and practice. You won't be good till you're in your 40s. So just stick with it. And so it wasn't until later on, like when I was about 35, 37, that I really got serious about it. And it was just about practice. People ask you, you know, how do you – how do you become an artist? You just practice all the time. There's just no other way around it. You just keep painting all the time, all the time. And so he kind of instilled with me the discipline to do that sort of, uh, do that sort of discipline to, to become a good artist. And you're constantly learning. You'll never know it all, but you just keep going forward and you paint like a hundred, you paint like about 50 paintings. One's good. You paint another 52 is good. And so that's how it works. So it's a really, one artist said it's not a great way to make a living, but it's a great way to make a life, and I'm sort of going to stick with that one. So, you know what I really like is I like the story that um, you share about some of the day-to-day activities. Here's a little village. It's in the Andalusia. Is that right? It's in the Andalusia Mountains, the Finca was? Yeah, they call it the Sierras, but yeah, it was called Andalusia, the, the southern part of Spain, outside of Malaga, uh-huh. probably about an hour and a half outside of Malaga. And it was like one of those little, if anybody's been to Spain or seen pictures, it's just those little white little clusters of uh, living areas up in the hills that the Moors put together. Mm-hmm. And tell us about the lovely local um, people in the village, how they've been living in the same village for so long. 
Um, I'm not. I'm not trying to. I just always love that part of the story. I can just imagine it. I mean, here you are, a um, traditional, very middle class um, young man, and you are saved from an incredibly bourgeoisie existence by the fact that you go to stay with Uncle Jack and learn how to paint, and you're in this village on a, uh, and you slept in the chicken coop. <laughs> yeah, the chicken coop. When I arrived, there was no electricity, uh-huh. and so we had gas for like a warm, a warm shower and gas for cooking. Mm-hmm. We had there was no electricity. He eventually got solar lights, but yeah, it was just in nature. You had a stream below you, so you went swimming in the stream. And the and the villages, the one below us called Arches was uh, all cut off from everybody. So there's a lot of inbreeding going on down there, but <laughs> they're just they're <laughs> going going to the going to a disco in Ar- Arches was a unique experience to say the least. <laughs> they had a little disco down there. <laughs> uh-huh. Uh-huh. But yeah, it was just it was it was as as pr- not primitive, but it was just life as simple as it gets. I mean, the guys just worked the farms. The seasons, yeah. So I went through all four seasons. So I saw the winter. I arrived in the winter, and then the spring, and then the crops with the olives, and the grapes, and the raisins, and the oranges, and the corn for the horses. And so I saw four seasons. And so that was really magical. I mean, it, it just changed my life. It did change your life. It's always always been a great part of your story. And one of the questions that TJ asked is she asked, um, you know, you talk more about that style of art. You gave it a term, and I don't remember what it was. You gave it a term. A la, a la prima. A la prima, which is, I guess, a French word for just done first. You, you do it just first. Like this, this is it. You don't uh, el- elaborate on it. We used to do, we used to do the study where you paint a picture in 15 minutes. You go, okay, here's your, like a still life. Do it in 15 minutes and don't screw around with it. Just go for it. And that 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 style always stuck with me. Like do it quick, do it without thinking about it. Just do it for 15 minutes, and that would be the. And it usually came out really good, really pretty exceptional. So what did you use for female models? Every everybody always wants to hear the story about how you got beautiful women to take and come and sit down and to model and to be depicted by an artist. It is the absolute um absolute dream of people, which is probably too too grand of a dream for most people to hope to obtain, but talk about that. Talk about the models, talk about the class getting together and painting the models oh there's naked ladies laying laying all over the place (laughs) no i'm kidding you no it would just be someone would just sit down they would have their clothes on we didn't do any uh nude modeling when i was there (laughs) and it was just (laughs) Uh paint a nice picture though oh yeah you're working there is yeah, the first time I saw Jack, I told you as a little kid, I thought I was going to walk on him painting a naked lady, you know, when I was like five years old. When he's living in Laguna Beach, I go, oh, no, he's going to be – in the back of my mind as a little kid, he's going to be painting a naked lady when I get there. So I guess that's yeah. sort of a artist cliche or artist thing. But no, you just pick out – yeah, people would model. People would sit still. That was the whole thing, just sit still. So it wasn't a very – was yeah, was wasn't there anything more than that. Was anything more than that? Okay, so, um, so you and I kind of have an unusual story together. We met. We were working. Um, we became friends. Um, we became friends really kind of gradually. <laughs> uh, we were working together for a long time. I don't think that we met outside of work for. I think we knew each other for a couple of years before we ever met. Uh, made a time to see each other outside of work. I think the first time we did that is when we took a trip and went up to Universal um, City Walk. But, you know, talk about that. Talk about that journey as an artist using the inspiration from psychics in order to motivate you. You have a simian crease 
in your left hand, a modified semi increase in your left hand. And a semi increase means you take what's in your heart to your head, so what comes out of your mouth is logical when in fact you're an intense, passionate, all or nothing human being and you want somebody to make sense of your emotions for you. Simians are always capable of acts of genius. One in 10,000 people has a single simian. One in 100,000 is a double simian. And a simian uh, has a struggle with their placement because they go through the early part of their life trying to understand where can they demonstrate their assets, their talents, their capabilities, their strengths, and receive recognition for that. And then when they do find their placement, it's usually in their 40s. And so you learn this style of painting, which was very rapid and very effective, um, but then you had a place for it, a real need in the world for it in painting weddings. And so talk about that just a little bit. Uh, how it just came about? Yeah, it was just it. If you're on the right journey, just sort of these uh, places and these uh, stepping stones arrive for you. Like I say, when I quit the pizza parlor as a manager of Lampos Pizza in Fountain Valley, the tango arrived, and that was my next step. And so, and then you arrived in that situation, and then all the other psychics around me as I went through my day-to-day struggles trying to stay alive as an artist, but... You know, it was a really, it really was a journey. I, I worked at FedEx for a while, and so I thought, well, if this doesn't work out, I'll just go get a job at FedEx. So it was, it was more of a let's just challenge the universe to see what it brings me. Mm-hmm. So it was, uh, it was, it was fun. It was fun, even though you know, I, I was never f- frightened or thought I was a loser or I was going to give it up or anything. It was just. You go backpacking, just so it relates to backpacking in Europe. You go backpacking in Europe, basically you're homeless, right? You just mm-hmm. got your pack on your back, and it's a journey. And every day you wake up and your your senses are alive, and you're living in the moment, and you're trying to figure out, well, in Europe you're thinking, how do I get from this place to that place? Or you're meeting people, and you're laughing, you're having a good time. At the end of the night you got to go find a place to stay. So when I was living out of my car as an artist, it was just again, it was that kind of a journey. And Jack did that, too. He was in his van, and he traveled all over Europe and through cold weather and everything. So it's just, it's just, you just, you're not afraid anymore. You just do it. Right. I think there was one point in time when you thought that, um, I remember you telling me about how you thought that all great artists had gone through a chapter of where they had um, lived um from a place of poverty, of course, not poverty consciousness, but actual financial poverty, and you felt as if you had this sense of kinship with other great artists that had suffered for their art and had been willing to give up material comfort in order to pursue art. And I think that's an, there's, an interesting, there's an interesting mindset difference that happens with an individual that realizes that they may not always have their creature comforts, but they have the comfort of knowing that they've done their life's work. So well, you pick, yeah, and you pick out these people that you really admire. I mean, you pick out like a Renoir or a Manet or a Van Gogh, and you just admire what they went through to create stuff. And again, all the impressionist stuff was really revolutionary and really radical back in the day. And so, as you go through this journey, you want you sort of in your mind imagination say. You want these guys to go, hey, you're doing okay, buddy. Way to go. <laughs> you know, we did it, you know. So way to go. I mean, you know, it's just – and you leave behind the legacy. You know, you're just leaving behind some really good stuff. But, mm-hmm. I, yeah, you always imagine that other artists who have gone through this journey, and it's sort of a – it's the artist's journey. And you just imagine them saying, okay, way to go. So, and those are the people you want to – those are the people you want to uh, – approve of what you're doing and want and you want to you want just that like to say imaginary peer group saying you know way to do it keep going hmm. so can i put you on the spot for a second sure no oh, thanks um so you and i worked together we we became friends we worked together but basically we were co-workers for a lot of years at what point did it shift for you and you realized that 
you know, I was a source of inspiration because my story is is that I was 16 years old. I wanted to be I wanted to be a psychic. I wanted to be a muse, and I wanted to drive a Citroen. And I never say that word correctly, but anyway, I wanted to be. Um, that's what I wanted to be. I wanted to be a psychic as my profession, and I wanted to be an artist muse. And I was forever on the hunt trying to find the right artist who was going to see me as their inspiration. So how did that sort of unfold for you? It's a very personal question. I've never asked you that. I think it was... <laughs> <laughs> no, how many times? So I'd go in there, right? And you'd, and you'd sit down at the easel at the beginning of the night, and you don't have any idea what you wanted to paint. And you always paint what you love or you always paint something that you find really interesting or something that would keep your attention. How many times did I paint you before we got together as a, as, as a wow. couple? So I'd look over at her and she was, and she got really dressed up. I mean, I, the first time I recognized her without uh, being in, in costume, basically, I didn't, I, you know, I didn't sort of recognize her. It was like, okay, is this you? You know, she would just walk through the mall dressed normally, but no, she would look really, I'm thinking about her right now. So yeah, she, she would sit at, she had this nice little zone all to herself. She had a table with all their crystals and rocks and all sorts of stuff on the table, and she would be dressed really nice. And she'd be sitting in a chair waiting for her customers to come along to have a conversation with her. So she just looked really intriguing to me, and you know, sort of, I guess, I don't think mysterious is the word, but it's just, yeah, it was just beautiful. It looked beautiful to me. She had hmm. always had nice colors on. And she just looked inviting, you know. She's sitting there smiling at people going by, and yeah, it was just quite a it was quite a scene. And then it had a really deeper meaning because you'd picture looking at her as being like one of the clients coming up. Well, tell me about my, you know, give me a psychic reading or tell me the deeper thing about what's going on in my life right now. So it had many layers to me. And people have bought her paintings. <laughs> you know, people have bought paintings of the. Uh, Images I did of Suzanne at the tango, and she was the tango. She was she was the uh, again many levels, many levels. It was food, it was entertainment, it was people. But she brought. But when they brought in psychics, it just brought a whole another dimension to the whole atmosphere, because there was a deeper sort of a conversation going on, more real than just the bar talk and just people, you know, socializing. So yeah, it was it was a many leveled experience. But yeah, just to see her sitting there was just I, I loved it. Oh, hmm. 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 <laughs> how that's cool great. is that? <laughs> <laughs> that's a great story. I've never I've never asked you that. So that is a really great um, way to put you sort of on the spot. And um, so TJ, yeah, if you want, I, yeah, go, go ahead. ahead. Go ahead. I was just. <laughs> I think you were, you and I were thinking the same thing. But you, you, what were you saying? If TJ, if you want to ask a question, what was that? Do you want, do you want to take and have Rich and Jack talk to each other, and then you be the one to sort of um, take that conversation to the places you want it to go? Because I've listened to these stories since forever. And maybe maybe you can bring some fresh material to the uh, conversation. Yeah, because I'd love to weave this together for Ace Folk Life because okay. I believe the legacy of uh, all of us evolves with time. And this belongs to the United States of America and the brand Ace Folk Life. And we can endorse those that we choose to be our friends and members that are real trustworthy. It's like, uh, you know, we're helping starving artists, but right now so many people with COVID-19 around the world like us, you mm. know, we're barely getting by to pay our bills. And this is a hard time for our entertainers and our authors and our artists. So I'd like to uh, spin this in a direction that Jack knows how to survive through the hard times as an artist, mm -hmm. and maybe between him and Rich, they can talk about inspiring the world and 
why the Ace Folk Life as a, a society and an association of artists, visual and performing artists, artists and authors should should support each other. You think that'd be a good family thing? Because my husband can no longer speak, but this was one of his desires and wishes. And we were doing festivals in Ohio County, and we got started with helping people that played bluegrass in the uh, Appalachians, right, and taking their stories for the Smithsonian and collecting stories of all the people. And, and I would write them in the newspaper, and people loved the stories, you know, and they were some of them were Bigfoot, but some of them were how they learned to play the mandolin or brought them over from the old country and a fiddle or, you know, a difference between a violin and a fiddle. So, But there's got to be some cultures in there that Jack and Rich can bring together from the old country or Europe. I mm-hmm. went to Spain and Madrid and uh, mm-hmm. other places, Lisbon, and – I love traveling the world, but, you know, I, I can't do that like I could because the money situation plus the government was paying me to travel. But, mm-hmm. you know, you know what I'm getting at? It's like people right. really do live, even during COVID-19. We're going to have some wonderful artists. But if Jack can w- r- leave us his legacy and his history orally now, and, you know, I know my husband. I go back and listen to my radio shows, and I remember – a part that I'd forgotten about him. And I know someday that uh, Rich is going to go back and listen to this story with Jack, and it's going to melt his heart. You know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? Right. So, so I like, that's I what like I'm the, talking about. I'm, I'm going to mute now. Okay. The oral mm. history is not as accepted in Western culture as it is in other cultures. Um, the American Indians place a great deal of um, emphasis on the bloodlines that create great storytellers. And storytelling as an oral history of a way of keeping track of what our history is as humans is valid in other parts of the world. But in Western culture, the oral history is not considered a valid history. Only a written history is considered valid. And there's something very, very different that happens when a person tells their story um, and they make, they make you know, a recording of what their history is about. And I am always sort of amazed at that. One of the things that I always find sort of interesting is that the Kabbalah was not ever meant to be written down. It was meant to be an oral history that was told from father to son, and it was studied in rabbinical groups, and it was a... It was a story. It was a human story. So I think sometimes, and I'm an avid reader of the first order, um, I think sometimes we lose the insight and the appreciation for the story that is just the spoken story. It's just as valid. It's just as important. And one of the last vestiges of where the oral history actually has a valid place today in society is in the 12-step groups. In the 12-step groups, people tell their story, it's recorded, and that is a person's oral history. So I want to I ask Jack and Rich if they would like to have a conversation. I'll mute, and they can listen, and um, we're all together in the house. So if, if uh, one of you wants to come and sit, sit in the back of the house, and do the phone call, that's fine, because we can't have any crossover. Okay? So, Rich? Yes, she called me. Rich? Okay. Yeah, I'm good. Okay, Jack's outside having a fag. That's fine. Can you come inside and sit in the back so yeah. there's no crossover? <laughs> That's yeah, right, having a fag. It means something else in England. It's a, it's a, it's a term for having a cigarette. And when you get to be 89 years old, nobody has to tell you if you smoke cigarettes, you won't grow to be old because Jack's already done it. So we can't scold him that way. But um, anybody else is open to scolding. Okay. Huh. So what? Okay. So what are we getting at? I think yeah, I think you want to ask Jack how he started. What's his story? He no, was in the military. I, I huh? want you to do. I want you to do that with him, but you have to be enough distance from one another that there's no feedback on the lines. Yeah, we're good. Okay. Okay, okay. Jack. Jack, can you I'm going to go me? mute. I'm going to go mute. Okay. Jack, can you hear me? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Oh, tell us. 
So tell tell the world your story about how you got started. You're in the military. You're working for your dad. All sorts mm-hmm. of stuff. So what made what made you become an artist? I mean, actually become an artist personally. Well, I, I think a lot of it was due to this uh, Carl Sathaler I mentioned in Long Beach Academy of Art. I started, I, I had a girlfriend, and she took me down there when I was about 11 years old or something. <laughs> and uh, then I just kept uh, popping in and popping out. And because she did different courses that were quite interesting. And uh, so I got I got hooked on the uh, the whole concept. And he was a very, very amazing teacher. He's quite, quite outstanding. He should need recognition. Uh, because they didn't ever get, ever get it from around Long Beach, and they didn't have. You know, he was sort of like an island of, of, of serious thought. He, he was a, he was from Vienna originally, and uh, so I was quite uh, I was quite fortunate on that. And so he, he taught philosophy also, and, and I think he, he actually conditioned people to to see to see a little broader person. So what? Uh huh. So what was the because what was the uh, uh, what was the break, what was the jumping off what was the jumping off point for you? You said you sold your house and you had the kids and the wife and the family. So what was the jumping off point for you to become to live the life of an artist, not just learn it, but live it? Well, it, it's sort of uh, when I was in there, I was in business with my dad and uh, so then I, I dropped out of that and then I was doing you know, hand in hand work and all the and so on and so forth to kind of get me getting in by there. And I had money and so forth. But it just came to a point where I realized uh, I wasn't uh, developing anything within myself. And, of course, the, the ideas I was hearing about art just kept, uh, you know, fasc- fascinating me. And so I, I started, you know, drawing and painting. And then this teacher was quite good. And uh, not it didn't encourage. He just uh, sort of set a level, which was quite good. He's a good teacher. And so I, I just carried on with that. So I was finally, you know, going to, uh, you know, every chance I could get to uh, to do that. And uh, I think one of the things, it was sort of like a question of seeing beauty. <laughs> and this is strange. It's, it popped up to me the other day that I was thinking about what, what sort of turned me on on that thing. And uh, I've been studying the model. Is, they bring in these models and all that stuff, and then the nude and all that stuff. And it used to really shock my mother and whatnot. But uh, I, I would uh, draw the model, and so, so that was that. You know, it was just like drawing a sunset. But one day I was there, and I was, I was fully up to... Uh, to go in to that, and there was a girl walking out of the studio, and uh, somehow or another, I, you know, I, I focused on every pretty girl there was, or anything like that. But then I saw her legs, and then I saw her legs from an anatomy point of view, and I, I could see the mechanics in it, you know, and I could, uh, you know, I, could, I was sort of like X-raying her entire, her entire uh, uh, structure of her, of her body, automatically, and so I thought, well, I'm, I'm making progress, and so I, I, I went from there. Like I just kept getting more interested. So you took your you took your family, and you bought a, a school bus. Tell us that story. Well, that 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 comes after it comes somewhat after it. That's right. I've gone back to the states from Mexico actually. I bought the school bus, but uh, I I just uh, I just couldn't handle the uh, the system. It didn't didn't suit me anymore, and so that's why I, I got the school bus. And uh, it just took off. And so I fixed the school bus up to the most comfortable way. I put it back. I mean, everything, <laughs> everything. And so we had, we weren't uncomfortable, but uh, uh, we were kind of uh, shocking people. And I got to the border and uh, Mexico, and I was trying to get in with this bus and everything like that. And the younger guy wouldn't touch it. And then what was really quite miraculous, uh, when I was going through there, I was just, I just turned 33. And he looked at my passport and, and he says, Mismo y de Cristo, pasale. He says, you're the same age as Jesus. Go on through. So that got me in. And so you know, you're in the sort of strange situations like that. And then I picked people up in the, in the bus because they had lots of room and there people walk along the road. So I picked them up. And I just got into Mexico kind of catching on as I went along how, how, how gracious they can be and how, how much uh, uh, openness there was down there. So I, I fell in love with Mexico, basically. <laughs> So you arrived, you arrived down the coast, and you set up a school? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and uh, they, they set up, uh, well, I set up classes there, and I was teaching there. And uh, then that just carried on. I had the numbers of students, and I taught in the local Posada, and uh, he can, you know, I was teaching around different places like that. And uh, so the teaching just uh, kind of came natural to me, and I, I, I 
and I enjoy teaching. And I enjoy discussing the ideas, and it puts you in the same framework as a student in a way. And so you have to you have to be able to uh, explain it and analyze it and so on and so forth. So teaching is sort of like a integral part of my my life. I, I you know we're at the place I have now. It's not nothing to do with economics or anything like that. I did in few students, and uh, and you know, do workshops because it's a uh, it's it's a good. It seems to keep it alive, you know. Yeah, what you're teaching sure, yeah. is not what you're teaching is not just uh, how to draw, how to paint. It's more of a when I was there, you taught about art theory, you talked about philosophy, you talked about the deeper meaning of being an artist and the art art lifestyle. One of your no, favorite books was one of your favorite books was uh, The Artist's Way. Yeah, we are. Yeah, that was good. That was good. Very so, good. Uh, it was a whole. It was a whole. Uh, and then I felt I had nature. I had sort of enough isolation there, and I had an, an ambiance with all the village. It was a beautiful village, and uh, so it was. Uh, it was. It was quite perfect to uh, to I uh, take the students over to the village, and they, they would be really quite excited, you know. And uh, I just uh, I just did it lucky, and of course, the place I had was an old olive mill, so it was 50 meters long and 11 meters wide, and so. We took all the old machinery out, and so I had a large studio and workrooms, and uh, so we, we worked with models. We worked with everything. It's really quite, quite, quite exciting. If anybody is close to a computer right now, you should look up Finca El Cerrillo, Finca yeah, El yeah. Cerrillo, and, and so you get an idea of what we're talking about. And again, oh, this yeah. was not a. This was real Spain. It wasn't Madrid. It wasn't a city. This was real Spain. I mean, real Spaniards. And when you were a, a foreigner coming into their the village, the village had a life that was been going on forever. But again, you're trying to teach people not just art, but what else, what would you like to express to your students as far as art goes? How it is? It's a lifestyle, or how it's a a You always said you you had a growth center. Art and growth center. What did the growth center mean? Well, the growth center is that uh, it goes along with it. You know, it's an observation of nature, for one thing. And then I think it's sort of a social responsibility for the artist. And uh, that sort of develops as you go into it. Because uh, the artist is, uh, the, of course, it's not as, not as steam like it once was. But I think I think the arts are the leader of society. I mean, they come up with the immense amount of, uh, of, of, of reality. It's sort of a check on reality. And so I think... It, and if you look at if you look at your culture, you know it's uh, Frank Lloyd Wright or it's different people like that. It's the arts that really uh, uh, capture people, and uh, and it's, it's it's the one that you can see and you can you can sort of test it. And no, I, I think art's a very tangible, uh, spiritual thing. You know, it may be paintings or sculpture or architecture, but it all goes together. So I've I've, I've done uh, I've done like courses like that for the docent committee and. Uh, in uh, where was it? <laughs> the in uh, where Taliesin is in the Taliesin's uh, uh, studio of uh, Frank Lloyd Wright. And uh, so, what do you so, what do you what do you mean by spiritual? What do you mean by spiritual in art? What is what is that? Well, it's a it's a changing about the your values basically. In other words, uh, uh, spiritual is just a question of your values. And so, in other words, you value money first, you know. You probably don't start out to be an artist, and uh, you're, you're interested in other things. You're interested in the the, the feelings behind things and, and reasons for things and stuff like that. So the the artist becomes a student, and uh, uh, and and he sees that you know the other thing is a little bit a uh, little a little bit vain, you know. And, and uh, of course, with art, you're 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 dealing with people. So I've, always, I've always taught, and uh, so that's always been very good. You know, when people got t- turned on to it. And uh, it's 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 effective, you know. And then the the art kind of uh, is a witness. Uh, it's not it's not it's not theory. It's actually doing something. So that's, that's a, yeah. It's a very tangible way. That's the word. It's tangible. And you're saying, as an artist, you get to move inside these lifestyles. Where you sort of you free flow from being living amongst the so-called peasants. I guess you call it. It's not really true, mm-hmm. but you live amongst simple people. But then you can. Then the next day you're whining and dining with the people with the tuxedo. So 
it's an interesting – explain that as being an artist, how you can go from one – you don't really don't belong to a group. You get to go in, in and out of all these different segments of society. Well, that, that, that does happen, and uh, so you're rather unique in different places because I was invited to diplomatic parties and all sorts of things, and uh, masonry and, and stuff I had, you know. It's studied, and I've seen it from a completely, completely different point of view. And I found that uh, the people really appreciated hearing it from a, a different point of view, you know, when, a little bit more objective, I think. So the, uh, the artist uh, kind of has open doors. He's kind of a fortunate person. So you're, you're dining with the, the governor one night, and the next night you're, you're talking to people in the streets. You know, it's, it's, quite a, it's, a, it's a very rich way to, uh, to live, actually. Yeah, you have and many that's, stories. That's, that's, you know, ups and downs. Well, your stories, stories you have a lot to do. It's, it's really, uh, well, I could tell stories for days, but uh, it's, really quite, it's really quite fun. There's, a, there's, a, there's that side to it as well. And uh, it, 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 it broadens you because you deal with different levels of people. And so, as I, as I say, you know, you're, you're diplomats one day, and the next day you're, you're talking, you know, uh, I've been stuck in the parking lot more. For a supermarket one time, and I met some really interesting people. You know, and we sort of set up a, actually a course in the middle of the supermarket where uh, lots of people were coming to talk to. <laughs> it was quite, it, 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 that was quite, 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 quite a challenge. But, but uh, so different things happen. Tell and us the, the story of the, tell us the story of the, what was it, the Virgin Mary or the Madonna that was in the village? That you had to repair. Well, somebody somebody got too close to the Madonna in the village down below. It's a small village, and we always thought that they were too bright anyway. <laughs> you know, that's the way they think they are. And uh, so somebody lit the candle too close to the Virgin. They were all made out of wood, and they had these robes on. And so, boom, she went up like a flash, you know, and, of course, it, it damaged her. And uh, she, uh, the face, everything's, everything's wooden. And, uh, of course, it took a little scorching and all that stuff. So they, the whole village come prancing out to bring it up to me to see if I could do something with it. And so I said, well, I'll give it a try because it was pretty, pretty badly damaged. And so I did. I went after it, you know, in a, in a, in a, in a serious way. And uh, and I repaired it. They could tell it was even damaged. And uh, so then uh, the reward was when they went to pick it up, the entire village came up. And they came up with little teeny uh, plastic bags full of money for me. I, I, was, I was, you know, willing to do it for nothing. And uh, so I have some pictures of that which are a little bit rude there because I, I have it laying out on a couple of uh, horses and, uh, uh, you know, so these things blocks and block off and I'm like, oh. not to be sitting on her tummy, working on her, on, her, on her face, you know, doing delicate work and all that. So it was, I have, I have some pictures of that. And it looks, it looks like, like non-religious, busy, busy actually putting her back in shape for the village. And it was quite, quite sort of half amusement and half reality. Yeah, again, we're talking about a time that was, you know, in the 1980s, and it was a whole different world. I think the bars just started to get TVs installed in the mm-hmm. bars, because you said yeah. in the old days, the men would sit around playing dominoes. Oh, yeah, yeah, of course, yeah. There, was a, uh, there, were, there were things they did together, you know, and then they spent a lot of time on benches talking and so forth, and television was, a, uh, I'd, I'd say, kind of destructive in a way, you know, it wasn't pleasant. It wasn't enlightening. It was just, you know, tempting you to buy this and buy that, and and then the phony news and all that sort of thing. It was, was it wasn't a plus for these people because some of them are fairly simple, and so they they were getting all the information from the television. And that's that's that's, that's the way to go. Really. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so yeah, we're talking about a time which wasn't that long ago, but it really was now. I mean, now it's a whole different. Spain's different. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the yeah. internet changed everything. Yeah, and, uh, so I was very uh, fortunate it, to be able to to be there with you. Well, it was uh, it was it was uh, you know, you really felt you were doing something because it gave people a different point of view, and uh, so that's the whole point was to see things in a little different way, and that, that's that's what I that's what I help people do. So you know, and it wasn't a kind of a preaching thing in any in anything. It's just that we just did everything a little differently, and. Uh, and they, they really enjoyed it too. But the food was different. You know, we did vegetarian food. We did yoga in the morning and uh, things that they'd never even heard of. And uh, it went over you know, very well, actually. But quite successful. Yeah. People would come and look for a, 
people would come and look for a really unique Fortnite, as they say there. Yeah, and, you, and you attracted quite a quite a cast of characters. Again, they're from South America and Denmark oh, yeah. and England, and you get yeah, right, you get yeah, some yeah. really you get some real eccentrics yeah. coming to visit you. <laughs> no, no, that was that was part of the fun, you know. So Finland and all <laughs> kinds of it was it was really uh, really amazing, and uh, then they they brought in good energy and uh, a lot of curiosity and. Uh, it was it's extremely international and so or non-national, and so it was, uh, it was, it was you know it's it really, actually a rather clean way to get educated. What I try to present, you know, so I, I like it. Was, yeah. yeah, you really have Hello? to give these pre. Hello. Yeah, Hello. you Hi. really have to give. You will... Hi, this is this is Khalil. Who's Khalil? It's um. Yeah. It's call, I'm calling from 434 Charlottesville, Virginia. You guys are psychic yeah. show? No, not tonight. Not tonight. Oh. No, we don't, we're not having a psychic show tonight. That's for another night. Oh, sorry. We're, we're talking. <laughs> That's okay. Call back next time. <laughs> hey, Jack. Yeah. Okay. So, again. Psychic was another, another, another department. <laughs> Maybe you could have done a psychic reading for him, Jack. Huh? The thing is that you uh, you project ahead on it. And I think the artist is usually a little on on the top of some of these things and uh, still doing some thinking because they're not moved all the time by the media and everything so much. You know, that's 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 important. You, know, you can kind of see through the falsehood, which is okay, a great deal of it. You know, it's a yeah. it's a kind of a low low dip in terms of the uh, the popular media. I think, you know. Okay, I think I'll now it's time to bring T. That's okay. Yeah, TJ, I think. <laughs> That's okay. Yeah, go ahead, Rich. I love hearing you talk to your uncle. It's so nice. I apologize what? to you. Oh, no, that's okay. I think it's your time, TJ, to ask Jack questions. I think you would bring a fresh set of questions to him. Well, Jack, uh, can you hear me okay? My voice coming through for you. What's that, what's that again? I didn't get that. Jack, okay, can you yeah. hear TJ? TJ is going to talk to you and ask you a few questions. She's the one who's producing the show tonight. She's in Florida, and she wants to mm-hmm. ask you some questions. She's been an artist. She's been a musician. She loves artists, and she loves spiritual growth, and she's a very oh. good psychic and she uh, reads from a tarot deck, and she's very, very good with her archetype work. So she wants to just ask you some questions. I promise they'll be friendly, and I just want her to take a take a different uh, slant because Rich and I both know you, but she has her own opinions about what, sh- what should be recorded for posterity in documenting your oral history. Okay, I'm going to mute myself. Okay, okay, I'll do that. And what's the name? Uh, hi, Teresa, but uh, you're familiar with, my name's Teresa Jeanette, but I use my initials, Jack, TJ, instead oh, TJ, of Teresa yeah. Jeanette. Yeah, TJ. Yeah, so, uh, okay. Yeah, so, so. Okay. Um, what, what uh, like that? Uh, now, were, were you born in America for uh, this recording? This is, you know, so we can get some buried details, like I'm an investigative reporter not just an right. artist or a songwriter, uh, but uh, the kind of art I started with was landscaping. But uh, I'd like to know, you're an American artist, so that would be what I would be wanting to know. Are you born in America, or were you born in the old country? No, I was born in America, yeah. I was born in Long Beach, California. Oh, you're a Californian, another one. Okay, I don't meet very many of those. <laughs> okay. Well, All yeah, right. It's pretty, it's pretty weird sometimes. And uh, I've noticed that for your age, 89 years old, would you mind sharing your birth date so we can get it right in Wikipedia? Well, I'm, I'm not too interested in that, of course. That's not my I'm, I'm, I'm like 40. I don't, I don't think in ages. Otherwise, I'd be old. No. May May eleventh, nineteen thirty one. Great. Okay, with, I'm hoping that uh, our Ace Folk Life people 
can help us get you a Wikipedia done. I didn't notice if there was one. Did uh, Did you know, Jack, were you ever put in Wikipedia? No, he isn't. Okay. No, 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 no. Okay, so uh, you've been able to help us worldwide and sell a lot of your paintings. Uh, do you know how many are left in existence that we could make G clays out of? Uh, can you tell? Give me an idea how many are left uh, that are still, you know, where we can get copies. In other words. Well, well, yeah, I think it's on the uh, uh, on the internet like that under Rutherford Jack, I believe it is. Uh, there's copies, there's a uh, certain website. It's on, I, I'm not too sure, but it's on Google and on, on a couple of things there. And uh, there, there's, there's a, a whole other thing. That, two huh? houses full. Two houses full of art. He very carefully did not sell his originals unless he had to. He sold copies. So he has two houses full, maybe three houses full of art. Plenty yeah, of yeah, art. Yeah. That's, that's so what true, type? Yeah. Is it portraits, landscapes, uh, certain countries? <laughs> Give us an idea of what's left in your library. I'm going to ask real strange questions, but these are more <laughs> for the long haul for all of us yeah. that do uh, investigative journalist work, and we do archiving. So uh, give us an idea of how many and how would you like to classify yourself? So, are you a portrait, landscape, everything? No, Explain no, I'm, I'm, that. I'm, sort of, I'm actually, I'm actually everything because I'm sort of interested in all the different aspects of it. So, I do figure, I do most, most of my work's rather conceptual. In other words, I do things which uh, have some kind of a, uh, a solid, solid feeling to them, which has some content. That's that's much most important to me. So, uh, so if I do even a portrait or something like that, I, I, put, I put the type of slant on it that, that makes it real to me anyway. And uh, so it's, uh, it's, it's I actually am very versatile. I just uh, I do all sorts of things, any kind of art. I do sculpture, I do uh, clay work, and I do uh, bronze, and I do uh, printing as well, etching and dry point. And I, I try all the different media. So I, I, I'm... I move around and I try to I try to master everything I can get a, get a hold of it as a mode of expression. As a master, how many different uh, genres are? What would you call that? Because you mentioned bronze, and I remember my father worked in copper or something on wood. I don't know if you went through that era where putting taking copper tin. He learned in high school in the fifties or forties, forties, I guess. Uh, <laughs> What, I don't even know what that is, but how many genres can we archive for you? And, and has your family archived your type of art? Because that's going to be their their uh, foundation of financial support, I would imagine, if you have grandchildren. Perhaps, yeah. I hadn't thought about that. But the, the main thing is it's, uh, it's very versatile, and so uh, and it's conceptual. And so uh, well, actually sometimes you do something that's quite timely or something about the age. You know the uh, situation of a certain period, and I'll do, I'll do satires on it as well, and critical things. And uh, so, and at the same time, behind it all, I, I was sort of uh, really sort of uh, working on the on the spiritual side of it. I'm always interested in you know the uh, the expansion of somebody's consciousness. So I feel kind of responsible for it when I do it. <laughs> Spiritual and consciousness, and you call yourself a conceptual artist, so you do individual pieces. Uh, are you still able to use your hands and your eyes to still do this, or do you need assistance? No, no, I, I do I do it myself, actually. So I can, I'll be a sculptor, just finished piece of sculpture, and... Uh, uh, no, whatever comes up, I usually take it on myself. Or if I have something like you know, clay things to work with, I take it to a foundry. Then I go in and I finish it up, and make sure it's right, and so forth. So I, I basically do it all myself. But naturally, you you work with uh, different skilled people at the foundry, especially. And uh, so so I guess I do have help. You know, and you learn each time you you, you get involved with in that sort of thing, and you, you you learn how they do it. You, you hang around the foundry and you see what the process is. And uh, so I, I, I enjoy to keep learning. Do you have a Do you have a book 
uh, of list of the types. Uh, let's say so many marble pieces or so many sculptures, so many mm. ceramic, so many canvas, oils, watercolor. You know where I'm going with this? You yes, have a list? I do, yes. Well, I do. I work in all the different media. So like in, in wood, I did a wood sculpture that's been carried in a village in, in, uh, in Spain. Uh, that's a life size type of thing. And then I do the uh, 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 bronze, and I've done also that sort of things which I thought was sort of suitable for a uh, centerpiece for some of the kind of a plus and things like that. Because uh, bronze, it's, of course, it starts with clay and whatnot. And uh, so uh, I work with a lot of media, and then uh, sometimes the junk stuff as well. And it's sort of like you can, uh, you can do a lot with it. Uh, no, I, I, I see something that interests me uh, if I drive around and go around Portugal and things like that. They get fantastic driftwood and things like that. And uh, um, you can walk the areas when the wind's been, and you can find all kinds of stuff. And then I go by a foundry. You know, the, well, actually, the, the marble I found was by a quarry. And I went and bought two beautiful pieces of pink marble, which one was became a mother and child. And the other one, I forget what they do with it now. But uh, so I ended up uh, uh, carving. I kind of like the challenge, you know, of, of, of sculpting the stone. It's, it's kind of satisfactory. And uh, I like it. Jack? Can I ask you a question? Yeah. We're trying to we're trying to understand the depth and the width and the height of your pieces. And so what TJ is asking you is she's asking you if you have cataloged it. And I happen to know the answer to that question. But has anybody ever attempted to catalog your current art collection? Has anybody cataloged it? No, no, it hasn't been done. No, actually not. No, uh, I have no. Now, things are now in storage in, uh, in Granada, in, uh, Granada and in, uh, right. also in, in, uh, in Guadalajara. I've got some pieces there, and I've got in the Manzanilla. So I'm uh, moving around like this, and now with the, uh, with the, with the way the travel thing is, and everything, I, can't, uh, I can't move very very easily and uh, importing and stuff. And I'm not quite sure. Where that's going to go. So I've got stuff stored all over the place. And of course, the most of my work is, is in Spain at the, uh, where I have the, uh, the, I have a center. I've got a, a nice size house there. And it's just stuff full of you know, sculptures and paintings and stuff. So I, have, right. I couldn't even guess. Well, let's say you're going to live to be the normal 125 years on the planet. My husband's gran- uh, grandfather lived a, 109, well, it was 108 years and 11 months but you see people living you know 110 Mm. 120 but uh let's say the average lifespan is 125 on this planet Mm. and that's based on god maybe or whoever those were that said on this planet because of the oxygen decay the soul the spirit that on this life lesson journey we'd only live to 125 that only leaves you about uh, what is it, ninety to a hundred, and then twenty-five. So thirty-five years to get everything cataloged that you want to have copied, not sell the originals, because that's your estate. That's your uh, Rutherford estate established for your foundation mm-hmm. in our Ace Folk Life. Well, we need the John. Uh, we need the Jack Harris Rutherford Foundation set up for your estate. And get all the originals that are left on the planet because there's only one Jack Harris Rutherford left. Uh, so you're not an AI, right? You're the only biological. So with your uh, intent that God gave you, and because you taught soul and spirit, and that's what you want to be remembered for, and exactly. you. That's what you're wanting to talk about more so than the physical reality of the pieces. So I should let you do that is to get to the soul. You want to talk about the spiritual soul part of it. Can I leave that up to uh, uh, Rich? And uh, would you mind if I ask uh, your Suzanne and Rich to ask your family members? Do you have any siblings, brothers, sisters, uh Family members that will help the state set up. Well, uh, they probably would help if they were conscious of what's happening there. Uh, I, have, I have, you know, daughters and sons and all sorts of stuff that uh, uh, 
I think Rich could probably handle some of that. That would be good for him. You know, he could uh, sort of clue them in. I have a, okay. What about you know, in so Spain? Do they? Uh, <laughs> I know with COVID nineteen, they may try to do like they did during the wars and keep the artwork in their country. They may not let you bring it back to America, so you may have to only sell it or have an auction at your home or, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, get an auctioneer. I don't know how you're going to do that with your houses. Mm -hmm. Now, do you choose to live in America or are you going to, how are you, what are you going to do with your homes? You've got three homes, but two in other countries, Spain and Mexico. Is that correct? Yes, yes, I have. I, I don't own property in Mexico, but in Spain I have two houses. And, uh, oh, two so houses in Spain. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And uh, one of them in the village, and the other one is the, the house I built. And, and it's a, it's kind of an architectural little wonder. I, I, I had a lot of fun with it. This, 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 you right, built uh, a house, too? Yeah, well, yeah, <laughs> I mean, yeah, 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 yeah. that's artwork. Well, I I <laughs> that counts. <laughs> I didn't do all the, I didn't do all the, all the jackhammering and stuff like that. It's quite a big house, and uh, so I was quite pleased with that. But I designed it and, and did, did all the, uh, all the uh, manipulation to get it done, doing things unusual. Have you done a you know, picture? Don't... Have you done uh, yeah, an oil sure. painting of it? Uh, no, I have photographs, photographs of it. Okay, maybe it's... Rich can do it like he does a wedding. Yeah. If you give him a yeah. picture, maybe he can uh, uh, sustain that, and we can make a yeah. clay of it. But we need to establish you in our group, you know, in our Ace Folk Life, like we do with the Smithsonian and our our stories that we put, you know, and we we would put them on records or CDs or cassettes in the old time. But this is going yeah. right into our internet archives, so. Oh, yeah. uh, yeah, but if you'd like to now, talk about – you You want to tell people how you get the soul and the spirit because you love teaching. So this is how some people might not understand that there's great artists, and then there's those like you that feel like you're putting your soul and spirit, and you want to capture the essence. So I, I get at my heart what you're talking about. Some people can do artwork, and it looks like artwork, but it looks like stone or wood. You have the mm. ability to capture the soul and the spirit and the God source of the wood or the whatever you else, whatever your medium is. But mm. tell us what you're talking about when you're talking about your spirit and soul, and you want to teach that or have taught it for how many years? Well, I taught it now. I don't know, probably about fifty years. I don't know. I've always started right off teaching art. You know, as soon as I was studying, I started passing it on. And so I have got this teacher's streak in me or something like that. And uh, so I started quite, quite early in teaching, and, uh, uh, which I enjoy. And then you're dealing with people and you're talking about art and you're in love with it. So, so it's good feedback all the time. And uh, so I've, I've, I've been doing that for some years now. And uh, so the, in any place where I teach, I just set it up the same way. And then a lot of people coming from, well, actually, I've really in a natural group quite well, I from coming here from Israel and from Finland and so on and so forth. And uh, so, which I like, I like the variety and everything like that. It's quite, quite fun. And uh, so then they go back and they, uh, they probably, you know, you know, people ask where did it, where did that happen and all. So it's a, it's, a, it's the best advertiser I know of. It. Just do a good job, basically. <laughs> Well, do you have any limited editions of certain pieces that are more popular in other countries than in America? How many pieces uh, – well, we've already asked you that. We're going to have to get your family to catalog your state. But in the meantime, uh, with this with this Ace Folk Life Association, with our club, uh, mm-hmm. is there a way that we can uh, assist other artists with uh, maybe uh, – helping them learn how to uh, have other artists, uh, you know, COVID-19 pieces. Are there any pieces that you and Rich could do during this time, 2020, to uh, support Ace Folk Life? Can we ask you to uh, work together and think of something with our colors? Uh, You know, we've got our logo blues and greens and black and gold, but – uh, oh, yeah. Is there any way to establish that the Rutherford uh, estate and foundation of artwork 
is established uh, to help people around the world? And because you've taught around the world, do, how, how can we make this happen, Jack, to uh, bring your estate into uh, uh, copies, duplicates, jaclays, things like that, and get the Ace Folk Life endorsement on it? Does, does that make any sense? Some commemorative no, 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 no. piece. Yeah, I understand okay. that. Well, yeah, well, I talked to Rich about that, and uh, he knows it pretty well. <laughs> and uh, I have, and on, on the internet, I do have a, a, a pretty good uh, website of, uh, of work as well. It should be on there, and uh, that's that's all that's all available. So, so we we've thing. got the pricing. So you've got some that you've uh, uh, numbered, like limited editions, already available. Is that is that a correct statement? Well, a limited edition just means what it says there. I mean, there's not they're not being turned out by the hundreds. You know, I do one or two pieces, and then uh, or a small series. I don't do large numbers of things, and uh, so I keep it. I keep it that way, and it stays a, a bit, if anything, a little bit exclusive. You know, so people have to know about it and hear about it when they buy it. So that's Jack, when you get into it. Can we work a out a of deal? Mm-hmm. Go ahead. Yeah, Jack has another a number of like uh, prophetic pieces that would just say what's going on today. I mean, he did this one called "The Last Chair on the Titanic," which is a really dramatic oh, yeah. piece. You remember that one? And he well, did yeah, a number yeah. of uh, number That's of right. series of like it. You know, back in the day before the you know this all happened, they look they look pretty tragic. I mean, as like fires were burning and. People were running, and yeah, they're really kind of dramatic uh, images. So well, I think if prophetic, he had those, prophetic is, huh? is, uh, prophetic is the word I use. You, I think you intuitively feel something's going to happen, and uh, you see it. And you see it visually right away. I, I've got I've got a couple of pieces. The la- latest piece I did was uh, I called it "Still Falling," and it shows people upside down falling, and that that's happened in the last month or so. And I. They keep pulling it out, deciding whether they want to paint it or not. I've done the drawing, and it is it's sort of a cascades of uh, of humans coming down. And I, I think it's it's become more and more true, you know. So it's, that's what's sort of happened. Curious. Yeah. yeah. Again, I don't know what happened to his website because he he had a whole website up, but yeah, he has a number of prophetic pieces that he did in the '80s and the '90s or '70s even. Mm-hmm. That you would look at today, and they're more, they're more relevant today now than they were then. Well, does he have a webmaster? Maybe you can find out web- from his webmaster. No, I don't know what happened to that because that was in Europe. But he had a website, and then it just went down because he he you know he didn't take uh, he wasn't available to take care of it. So. Oh, he, I see. He needs, uh-huh. he needs a he needs. A, yeah, somebody stole I need his to name. Look, you need to look into that, don't I? It's sort of the ne- neglectful of that sort of thing. You know? Well, I'm looking at those yeah. on my own. Yeah. You and I looked at so, that. Yeah, yeah. That's, 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 that's a fault. I know that. So well, we'll I have to look up Jack that. Harris Rutherford and Jack Rutherford, but the name, your name, just Jack Rutherford, I think was 15K or more than that. Right. For the name, yeah. alone, just the domain name alone. But I don't know if it was in Europe. I don't know what company. Uh, some companies co- come and go uh, with the domain services and webmastering, but we'll just have to see what happened to your. But that's another reason to have Ace Folk Life because we want it to be like they do uh, perpetual. Um, we want Ace yeah. Folk Life to help artists keep their art going and uh, especially limited editions. And, you know, like we would, when I was an artist in Hawaii and I had to go before them to become an artist of Hawaii, but my girlfriend did it for me with the state of Hawaii and took my artwork. So, but they made, uh, you know, I I sold pieces from 500 to $5,000 and then uh, they made pogs, which is something, uh, it's sort of like I don't know what a POG is, but it was. They said it was like a milk. Uh, the little tops you used to pull out of the glass milk uh, oh, yeah. tops. Oh, I don't know. And uh, they made. They took my artwork. I didn't, but uh, at my deceased husband, he got to, a whole bunch of them and gave them to his family. 
in Oklahoma to keep for uh, investment of my artwork, but it was by my, my name, Thurmond, right? T.J. Thurmond, or Teresa J. Thurmond in Hawaii. But it mm-hmm. may say Thurmond or But the uh, thing is that people went and made money in Hawaii off of my artwork. Of course, some mm-hmm. of it's still out there. So what I'm asking you, this is something that other people did, and it helped the uh, community in Hawaii, in the gaming industry, and in these, uh, I walked in, I couldn't believe it. My husband made a whole industry out of selling those pogs with my Good artwork yeah, out yeah. of it. So there's ways that people, you can help other people make a living by selling your prints or your uh, promotional <laughs> merchandise. And uh, yeah, yeah. so this is something we need to look at for your family because. I know that I was shocked when I saw how many people were uh, – my husband took me around to the retail stores uh, showing me uh, what they were doing with my artwork. I was shocked. The man yeah, laughed. He couldn't believe it. it uh, I went in, and they wanted some real expensive uh, price for my uh, these pogs that were in a glass case, and this man was uh, making this big – negotiation with my husband and he about had a heart attack when he told him well this is the artist you know so what would you give her and he wouldn't even give me a break on the on my own artwork so these are things you need to consider while you're still alive Mm -hmm. because Mm -hmm. it happened to me it could happen to you you know they can make other things so uh we want to I have to sort of get out in the world with this sort of thing. I've been had my nose in the studio and in the Spain there, living kind of isolated. And uh, I, I sort of actually call it on now that I'm going to have to sort of broaden out my artwork and, and see what I can do with my work. I, oh, I have, definitely. I have, I have the first thing I was asked for was a catalog. So this is something your family needs to do, Jack, because – so let's just say we got 35 years, but this is 2020, Jack. So if you'll allow me as a psychic uh, lady that has this uh, legacy to keep my husband's artwork alive, uh, his all his artwork is in Kentucky, but it's up to his sisters. The local museum wanted to help sell his artwork, but he only sold prints, and that's what I told Rich about. Uh, or no, mm. uh, on the on the show, Rich or Suzanne, I forget which one, is mm. never sell your originals unless you really are starving. <laughs> but if you're, if that's how you, if that's how you made a living, that's fine. But now mm. we've got all this stuck up, up, over in Europe, and we can't get to it right now. So here yeah, in 2020, yeah. with COVID-19, you have 9/11, so you're at the perfect cusp. Uh, for Americans, this is 9 5 2020. So, we're going to have this as an oral recording forevermore, and we got about 10 <laughs> minutes left. So, I'm going to mute, but I'd like you to use the last 10 minutes with uh, Rich and leave uh, your ideas. And this Ace Folk Life Club is to be built on people such as my husband who died. I don't know if they can find my artwork in Hawaii. I don't even have my own artwork. I'm the last artist to tell you how to keep control because I lost control over all my artwork. (laughs) Okay. Mm -hmm. So uh, it it can be done very easily. So I'm going to let you and Rich talk about the control and the estate, but Ace Folk Life would like to be a part of that. And then we can be like those people that were selling my artwork for you. We can help put it out on the domains and then maybe, you know, you can help keep artists, starving artists in mind, uh, help them, Mm -hmm. help, help, us find them help us list Mm -hmm. them and and help them make money themselves by being a social society you know because you love people okay i'm gonna mute okay and then maybe you and rick and suzanne can work on that okay back to you rich and suzanne okay Okay, and thank you for uh, your attention and uh, i'll i'll be serious about that i'll do something about it okay well what what, yeah i think one of one of the family members or however it's going to work out in the days ahead, someone's going to just have to take photos and catalog all your work. I know you have many photos and you have pieces and you sold many pieces. So, yeah, that's just a process of uh, cataloging all that stuff. 
And no, I think, no. yeah, that'll be, a, that'll be a family member who has the time and the, the energy to do that. But what do you think? What do you, what do you think of your legacy you've left behind so far, Jack? Well, I don't know. I've I've had an immense amount of attention here uh, lately, sort of getting out as much as I have, and uh, which has been kind of gratifying. I didn't know anybody even knew about the name and stuff, and then they'd say, oh, Jack Rutherford. So, so there's something's going on without my even knowing it, because I do, I do live up in a sort of a remote place, and I haven't, this is my first big trip out where I've stayed over in my and uh, So I'm, I'm sort of catching on now with, 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 with some of the possibilities. So I'll look into it. Rich will help me with this too. Sure. We'll give yeah, some, we'll, put, some pointers. Uh, we'll get some, uh, put some, put some effort into it. But yeah, it's, you've lived, you've, uh, you have a number of pieces. I'm sure your your photos and your images are out there somewhere, and we just have oh, to yeah. gather them all together. That's right. Yeah, I'll I'll look into that because uh, they are. I've got most everything on some kind of website or some. Uh, under under some some kind of a heading, and then I've got I've got some big collectors who have photographed everything as well. And so I'll, I'll kind of, I'll kind of look into it now. Suzanne, so you're we're on a recording, so why don't you tell people how they can find you on Facebook? Because that's how well, I want people to have an opportunity to take a look at. Uh, you and your well, name. Just talk well, about I'm, little, I'm, little, I'm not on Facebook. Are. I'm not on Facebook. Yes, huh? you are. Yes. Am I? Yes. yes. Well, how did, how, did, how did that happen? Um, I I don't know, dear, but I um, <laughs> you're on Facebook <laughs> and uh, your picture's on there, and there's a picture of you uh, sketching. Uh, right out you know, on your property where you um, have your home today in Spain, yeah. and you're sketching, and there's several pictures of you. So just tell them your name, and people can go on to Facebook, and then uh, they can look at your work, and they can look at your lifestyle, and they can look at the beautiful house. Just mm-hmm. give them your name. Just give them your name so they can look. Well, I'll do that. <laughs> I will. That's a surprise. I'm sort of a, I'm, I'm sort of like a, a lost soul on that sort of thing. I'm, I'm going to make a little effort there now. I find out that it's, it's important. It's, it's, it gives you a, you work a chance to be seen, and people appreciate it. So that's, that's, I'm all for that. Okay. Sounds good. So it's Jack Harris Rutherford. Exactly. Jack Harris Rutherford, and so uh, they can send you a friend request. They can follow you. And then mm-hmm. we can uh, be in contact with them. They can also contact Rich Flynn, and right, he right, has. Right. And, and Rich, do your web page for us. So I'm at richflynn.com. And well, that's good. Email rich at richflynn.com. Right. Rich at richflynn.com. So. Those are those are ways, and we would love to hear from people uh, about the inspiration of living the life of an artist, the act of faith, uh, the resilience, uh, the support of family being a very important role in being an well, artist. Also, there's the small well, world story. Does anybody out there own pieces of Jack Rutherford? Remember the lady who showed up and had a story? Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yes. yeah they're all over the place. So I've not kept very good track of them, though. But, uh, I mean, I have no list of people that would collect my work. I, I, I don't really have it. And, uh, they usually get in touch with me. I have, I have one major collector in the, in New York, uh, and uh, he, would, he would supply very good, uh, some of my best work. Uh, I'll get in touch with him and have him send out uh, some photos. Huh? That would be good. So tell us the name of your number one collector. Well, his name is Rimbert Oiling, E-A-R-L-I-N-G. Okay. Rimbert, really, and he lives in Mallorca. No, well, yeah, Mallorca, that's right. Okay. And did he live in Europe before? Well, uh, I don't have any established, uh, well, I've been in Europe, so I uh, can't actually live myself. Uh, I, don't, I don't know what's happening in, in Europe now. There must be okay. some uh, Jack, I would really whole... like a copy I really want a copy of uh, 
I'd like you to sign it and give me a number. It's the Blue Jesus. It's oh, on yeah. Facebook. I'd like yeah. a copy of that, please. I don't know how much a copy, but I'd like it signed and numbered, G. Clay, of that. Could you supply oh. that? Could, since it's a copy and uh, we're, we're helping with Ace Folk Life, can you give us an Ace Folk Life price on the Jesus? <laughs> It's beautiful. Yeah. It's on Facebook and under under your name. So somebody put your artwork. Oh, you're at a big meeting with people. I think this is your daughter. She's very beautiful. And oh, I yeah, put her on beautiful. blog talk. So your daughter's uh how many children uh will be managing your estate? Because if it's not your siblings, it'll be your children, right? Right, yeah, of course, yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, that's who they'll they'll want to. Uh, well, I, don't know, I don't know. It depends on whether they're interested in it or have time for it. Oh, if, forth, you know? oh okay. They, well, you they, if they're not they interested, you know, they, 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 well, they just they just take it for granted. You know? <laughs> like, oh until, my! Uh, <laughs> like that, yeah. I have, I have one, I have one <laughs> piece, Well, do you have a name? Do you have a name for the blue Jesus? Is that did you name? Do you name each piece so I'll know? I'd like to have a numbered original. Well, I can't have an original, but I don't mind having a, a limited edition G. Clay. My husband and I used to do uh, like no more than 5,000 was standard. They prefer mm-hmm. you to have like 2,500, but you just yeah. number them and you tell people. So when you number them, you only like one of 2,500, two of 2,500, but you you give them a, a certificate or authentication that you personally are your estate or your like Ace Folk Life will not sell any more than that limited edition, and then that's well, it, right? But it goes well, up in value. Well, well, let's see, of course, yeah, yeah that's, that's logical. Well, I'll, I'll, so, I'll do that. I'll talk to, talk to Rich about that. Just want to do more about that. I do. Actually. <laughs> All right, Rich. I want the G- I want the blue Jesus, please, signed on the bottom and dated in 2020. So, can yeah. you make me a cop a G Clay of that? And uh, I I I would like to just pay a hundred dollars if you don't mind. Because <laughs> oh. <laughs> I'm special. Over how many? Over how many? Over how many months? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, I'd folks, like to pay it's a dollar a month. <laughs> yeah, yeah, a dollar a month. I can afford that. It's beautiful. I love it. Uh, the blue Jesus, and it's got yeah, red hair, but it's got like a knight in the background, and uh, I just really like it. But I, I collect Jesus pictures. My daughter died uh, last year, so it's been a year, and I'm trying to get over that, but I've got two Jesus pictures that she started for me in my living room, so this one will go quite nicely <laughs> These orange colors, orangish red, are the colors of my couches. So uh, I have black, gold, and this orangish color in the background. So I've already got it. That'll match. That'll match my living room. So we'll just have to get me a copy. Yeah, we'll have to get me a G Clay copy numbered. But uh, who's got the original of that? Do you have the original? It's at. It's at. It's at. Uh, it's in Spain. Oh my gosh. Well, certainly y'all can figure out how to make a copy of this yeah. picture for yeah. a G Clay. Yes. So well, DJ, we can, we can do, we can do something. Uh huh. Thank you. I'll, 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 I'll look before you die, sure. I want a, I want a copy before you die, so it'll increase in value if you don't mind. <laughs> He's not going to die anytime soon. Thirty-five years. I'll have it paid off. I'll let you know when it happens. I'll let you know. I have it paid off. Okay. Thank you. We're going to have you. Nice talking to you, okay? And, uh, okay. I'll, I'll, I'll do something about that. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. Well, I picked care. my piece Hold out. I, I haven't got Hold to see on. everything, but okay. I want that one, whatever that is. But make that the, the blue Christ or blue Jesus or whatever. But you know which one I'm yeah. talking about. It's the, it's the oh, one yeah. on Facebook. All right, yeah. great. Well, folks, we're out of time, and you hear me trying to negotiate a special hundred dollar G Clay <laughs> number <laughs> limited edition. So I'm negotiating for a spoke life. <laughs> I've got to go on GoFundMe and I, I'm retired widow that's doing this for 
uh, philanthropic voluntary reasons. (laughs) But I I, I still want a copy of that because it'll look so good in my living room. (laughs) Yeah, it looks so great. I don't want to put a Jesus is up to bat or not. <laughs> yeah, well, I've got a huge, like a six by eight over one uh, one's couch, but over the other couch where I would like it, it's just about the size, a little bigger than like a 16 by 20 or something. Yeah, you know, I don't know what. Size. Is that the, whatever the G Clay's? What's the G Clay size? Something like that, right? I don't know what the. I, I, but it, I, I can't remember you, it's framed already, but I'm going to replace it with uh, your picture there. So it'll go really nice. So I'll have original uh, signed limited edition <laughs> G Clay. <laughs> but <laughs> let, tell, uh, real, real quick, let Rich tell people what a G Clay is. Because I didn't even know what it was. Because I was asking him for a limited I don't, I don't edition. Have, I don't have a clue. I'm, TJ, I'm the expert on G Clays. I went to I went to Xerox School of Training and learned how to how to price and sell G Clays. I um, G okay, Clay well, is, G Clay is a um, a maximum number of dots of ink which create a photo like uh, impression. Hmm. It's done on canvas. Uh, they used to have really strict size limitations that no longer exist. There's still size limitations, but they're not as strict. And G clay is supposed to be as close to the original as we can get today with our current technology. Well, that's okay. the best you can do. That's it. Yeah. Well, I'd like a copy of that bef- uh, as soon as possible, please, okay. for my 2020 year to commemorate Jack Rutherford, director of Ace Folklife Club. Did you accept your honorary position, Jack? Well, we, it's name, name only, but did you accept your position as the global world Ace Folklife director? Well, I, if it doesn't cost me anything, I guess I can do it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It may cost you a hundred dollar G clay. <laughs> no, no. No, 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 I'm only kidding. There, I'm only kidding. Is there it doesn't for cost anything. What was that? Room for advancement. Is there room, is there room for advancement? More volunteer well, hours available. More volunteer hours available. We're, yeah. we're working that out with whatever whatever Suzanne and Rich say because my husband has passed and his sister was running it in Kentucky with me and my mother, but. Uh, she's got all my husband's artwork, but they're negotiating their own family estate. And since I left it all, I don't know that they'll ever include me in anything anymore. So it's going to be the second artist estate besides my own and my husband's that I've been left out of. So wow. I'm just telling you, I'm not doing really good in this Ace Folk <laughs> Life. I keep I keep getting left out of financial affairs. So we'll have to work this out. I'm going to teach you from all the things I learned not to do, folks, when you're an artist. <laughs> Okay. All right. Well, we'll leave that up. We'll leave that up to Suzanne and Rich, folks. Okay. But we do have PayPal's attached to our Ace Folk Life, and Rich has uh, Rich Flynn is going to uh, run our Ace Folk Life, and and Suzanne our ACIR Radio. But they're both helping with ACIR Radio Club, and uh, please uh, honor Jack Harris Rutherford and get on the list for your copies of Dana Point G Clay's with. Rich Flynn and Rich, I'd like one of yours to go and match the same colors of that, but you'll have to find me one. <laughs> but it can be a pretty landscape, or we'll we'll negotiate that, okay? Because <laughs> we got to work on the art in my living room. All right. Well, Ace Folk Life, I'd like to have one of those little Ace Folk Life stickers on the back or on the side <laughs> or the bottom or something. You know, we'll have to figure that out, folks. So we know that. It came officially endorsed by the Global Ace Folk Life Association, right? Thank you. All right. Well, Jack, Jack, we'll have to have you back sometime, Jack, once we get all your uh, stuff, maybe before the end of the year. So please be working on that. Rich, you need to be commissioning us a 2020 9-11, you know, with something for 2020 9-11, Rich, because I know you can do one. (laughs) <laughs> okay. What's the, thank you. What's that? All right, TJ. Thank you very much, and thank you. It was a great Rich. show, and thank you for having us. Yeah, okay, Rich. Rich, yeah. did you understand? 
nine eleven. Oh, say that again. I'm sorry. As, uh, we need to have you for the Ace Folk Life commemorating the Jack Harris Rutherford Rich <laughs> Flynn Association. We're marking 2020 during this COVID-19 epidemic. This is going to be – we need a commemoration for 9-11 for Made okay. in USA. And the Ace Folk Life, you've got our endorsement. But we've got to have that little logo, the Ace Folk Life logo. Yeah, and it's, I'd be happy to do it, that for you. Wonderful. Okay. That Ace Folk Life. And uh, if you could do that and commemorate something, you can create it or collage. But Suzanne, just make us something for this year that we can use to sell when we go, you know, online to promote G Clays. Okay. <laughs> for okay, all of Okay, we'll artists. do that. Thank you. All right. Well, Okay, for 9-11-2020, this is wonderful. Let's have Jack back sometime, and uh, after this, you guys go back and hear it and listen to the other parts while he's still alive. We got, I tell him we got at least 35 more years, so we'll we'll keep working on it, right? All right. That sounds great, TJ. Thanks a lot. All okay. right. Love and, love and light. Thank love you. We're going to play the music. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, okay, we'll